everyone to the seventh lecture of the bioinformatics course halfway there and today we will be talking about the R language for statistical computing. Um, it's one of these tools that as a bioinformatician you use a lot. Um, programming is more or less fundamental. Um, for today I have a lot of slides. We're at slide two of a hundred today. Um, so I changed the introduction a little bit because normally we start with the answers to the assignments. I thought it would be better to put those all the way in the back. So we can just see how many slides we can do. Um, and then if we have time left, then we will the do the answers for the previous lecture. If not, um, then that just has to wait until next week. So that means that you guys have a week more to do the assignments. Um, but for today, I wanted to talk about R because I think it's really important that when you do bioinformatics, you definitely need to learn how to program, right? So I just wanted to take one of these languages, which is relatively easy to get into. Um, and I think R is a perfect language for a beginner. Um, so if you're a beginner and have no programming experience whatsoever, um, during the next three hours, I will try to convince you that programming is easy. Um, well, it's not easy, it's as hard as you want it to be. Um, but so we will be starting off with some basic programming techniques, like how can I use R as a calculator? Um, then we will be talking about things which are R specific, like types and variables. Um, afterwards, we will be talking about control structures and how to output things like writing a file or writing um, a log file and these kinds of things. I wanted to say a little bit about string escaping. And then part two will be linear regression, because I think that linear regression is one of these tools that is really, really useful to model your data and get some more insight into what is happening. Um, so we will just go through an example of one of the basic data sets in R, and I will show you guys how you can do single linear regression, multiple linear regression, and quadratic regression in R. Um, and then, like I said, if we have any time left, we will do the answers to the assignments of the previous lecture. But I put them all the way in the back. So unless anyone really objects to it and says, no, I spent the whole week working on it and I want to know the answers now, um, then we will do them now. But I, I, I don't think that it's the biggest deal in the world. All right, so let's just start, right? So R as a calculator. Um, so of course, um, let me first show you guys R, right? So R is um, a tool which you can actually easily install. Um, I don't have a Firefox window open, so let me actually show you guys the Firefox window. And then I hope it's not too big. Well, it's actually a little bit too small, so let me move it a little bit bigger. Um, so if you want to install R, um, you just say R, download, right, and Google knows what you want. So if you're on Windows, you just go here, you click the download R button, and then you just open up the executable that you download, press next, 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 finish, um, like you do for installing any program. Um, and then you have R installed. So once you have R installed, it looks like uh, this. Uh, let me close the Firefox window so that you can see the R window. Um, so then it looks like this. Um, I have a slightly different version, right? The newest version is 4.1.2 and I'm still at 4.0.2. Um, but this is how R looks. And then of course we can use R as a basic calculator, right? So if I wanna know what five times seven is, I can just type it in and R will tell me that it's 35. Um, so and for the slide here, um, we can use it as a basic calculator. Um, the main thing that you have to remember is that the decimal separator in R is always a period and never a comma, right? So depending on which country you're from, sometimes people use a comma. So they say 1,5 for 1.5, but in R it's always 1.5. Um, so hey, you can just type in things like uh, 5 divided by 10 or 1 plus 4. Um, there are some special operators, which is good because you want to do things like 5 to the power. And so you can do exponents. Exponents can be done in two ways. You can use this um, kind of exponent operator, or you can just use the double multiplication. So multiplying is just using uh, the, the multiplying sign, but using it twice will do 5 to the power of 2. 
You can do the Euclidean division as well. Euclidean division is very important in bioinformatics um, because it allows you to see how often a number is fully inside of another number and how many remains. So I have an example of that. But in R we, there's also a lot of special numerical constants like E and F which means infinite, um, NAN which is not a number and NA which stands for a missing value. So a little bit more about Euclidean division. So if I want to divide 100 by 39 and generally when people were growing up, at least when I was growing up and I was still young and in elementary school, there was this thing which is called long division um, where you would take the number that you wanted to divide, put it in the middle and then take the number that you're dividing by, uh, put it in front and then do these like lines surrounding it. So now the first thing that you have to do is um, more or less figure out how often 39 fits in 100, right? So it fits in 100 once, it fits in 100 twice, um, but it doesn't fit in 100 three times because then you're over 100. So if you do it twice, right? So if there's two times 39 wholly in 100, um, so then you subtract 78 and then you have 22, which is the Euclidean division remainder. Um, so Euclidean division is very useful, especially when you're starting to batch up things or, or divining groups and you want to know, well, I have um, 100 measurements, um, I have 39 boxes, and then of course I can have two boxes which are full and I need a third box and in the third box there will be 22 samples. Um, so it just allows you to reason about batches um, and it's used a lot for some reason in mathematics it always comes back um, so I just wanted to mention that you can do that so in R the way that you do it is if you want to get the Euclidean division so you do a hundred percent divided percent 39 that will give you two and if you want to get the remainder then you just do a hundred percent percent 39 um, and that will give you 22 so that's the remainder Good. So besides being a calculator, R also has a, a bunch of built-in constants, right? So for example, R, if you type in letters in R, it knows that letters signify the 26 uppercase letters of the Roman alphabet. Um, so just as an example, we can type in letters um, and then it will just show you um, that, no, that these are the letters of the alphabet. So it's A to Z um, and they're all uh, uppercase. Letters in lowercase um, will of course give you the lowercase numbers. So that's one of the nice things about R that hey it, it allows you to use these built-in variables. Um, besides of course knowing about the letters of the alphabet, R also, R also knows about the months. Um, so you have months.up which is the abbreviations for the English month names and you have the months.name which are the full names of the month. Um, furthermore, it also has this built-in pi, um, so it knows the, the ratio of the circumference of a circle to its diameter. So it's just a built-in constant, right? So if you, if you want to calculate something using pi, you don't have to type in 3.1415. Um, and this is not true for all languages. So for example, if you're thinking about the C programming language, the C, has no, uh, so the C language um, has no knowledge about what is pi, for example. It also has no knowledge about letters or months or abbreviations. So that's one of these things in R that you get for free. The language is aware of what letters are and what months are and it also knows like constants like pi. There's a lot more constants but I think these are the, the main ones. Furthermore, you can uh, use R for imaginary numbers. So imaginary numbers is when you take the square root of a negative number. Um, so we've all been taught in mathematics that when you multiply two numbers, uh, if, you multi or if you take a number and you do it to the power of two, right, then it, it, it will always be positive. Like three times three is nine, minus three times minus three is also nine. Um, of course, in mathematics, there's also a field of mathematics where um, by definition they say, well, the square root of minus one is something which is called i, which is the imaginary part of the number, and r supports this natively, which is really, really handy. Well, it supports it natively, but you have to tell r that you want to use imaginary numbers. So when you type the square root of minus one, r will just say, well, this is not a number. However, if you type the square root of minus one plus zero imaginary part, now it will understand, oh, you want to use imaginary numbers, 
let me help you and it will tell you that the square root of minus one is one imaginary unit. So this is really useful when you're doing uh, modeling. Um, for example, if you're modeling a, uh, a spring constant. Um, so in mathematics, imaginary numbers pop up everywhere. And also in biology, they, they sometimes do. Um, R has built in basic trigonometry functions. So if you want to calculate the sine, the cosine, the tangent, the arc sine, the arc cosine, or the arc tangent, um, it knows these things and they are built in. So you don't have to write functions for this. They're just available to you. The same thing about logarithms. So um, the only thing that I want to kind of highlight is that if you type log of 5, then it gives you the natural logarithm of 5. So the ln function, which we would normally write down as ln, logarithm natural. Um, but um, the log of 5 standard, so the log function itself, the base is the, um, is, is the natural logarithm. If you want to get the base 10 logarithm of 5, you can do log 10 5. Um, and if you want to get the opposite, right, the exponent, um, you can do exponent 1. So, of course, this is really useful when you do things like p-values, which are generally 1 times 10 to the minus 6 or 1 times 10 to the minus 7. So generally when you plot p-values um, and you make a plot, for example, across a chromosome or some other Hey, if you have like 100 p-values and you want to show them in a graph, then generally you don't show the p-values, but you show the minus log 10 of the p-value, right? And you do this because then it, the difference becomes very clear, right? The difference between 10 to the minus 5 and 10 to the minus 7 is very small, um, but the difference between the, the log 10 of these numbers is very big, right? Because the minus log 10 of 5, uh, the minus the minus log 10 of 10 times minus 5 is actually 5 and 10 times minus 7 is 7. So the difference is just much more visible when you do a, a plot. So the standard order of operations applies in R. So when you are programming in R, then uh, the first thing that when you type in something like uh, 10 minus 3 times 2, um, and these things come around on Facebook once in a while where people start arguing about it, but there's no arguing about how to do the numbers because the numbers or the, the, the order of operation is done by um, PEMDAS. Um, so PEMDAS is please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, and I bet that any language has a kind of um, donkey bridge, that's what we call it in Dutch, um, for kind of these, uh, uh, the order of, of operation precedence. So had we first do the exponents and the roots, so first 5 to the power of 2 or the square root of something, um, next is multiplication and division, and then lastly we do addition and subtraction. So have when we look at something like this, then first go is multiplication, so we do 3 times 2 is 6, and then we do 10 minus 6, so the answer here is 4 and not 14, which on Facebook, people always shout, oh, the answer is 14, which is, of course, isn't, because you have to you have to adhere to the order of operations. Of course, this can always be overwritten by using brackets. So if you really want to do 10 minus 3 multiplied by 2, you just put brackets around it, and then um, it's perfectly fine, and it will first do the subtraction and then the multiplication. So in R, everything is in memory. Um, so this is a drawback of R. Um, so if you load in a big data set, which is five gigabytes big, then this five gigabytes will be loaded into your RAM memory. So the RAM memory of your computer is limited. Um, so generally, nowadays computers come with like eight gigabytes of RAM or 16 or 32. Um, depending on how much money you spend on it. Um, but be aware that this is one of the severe limitations in R. So if you if you have like a massive data set, which is tens of gigabytes big, then R will struggle with this because it cannot load everything in memory at once. So it needs to keep part of the hard drive and start swapping. So things will get very, very slow. Um, but to manage this, there are some functions to manage your session. So what is a session in R? Um, well, if you open up your R window, right, and we look at R, then everything here which I type in is in my session. So if I define a variable, so for example, I say um, I want to assign to the variable called Denny uh, number 15 um, or something like this, right? Now I have in my session a new variable um, and this variable has the value of 15. Um, so 
everything has so this takes a little bit of memory for R to remember that the variable then he contains the number 15. Of course, if I start assigning millions and millions and millions of values to a single variable, then of course this will take much, much more memory. Um, but of course, everything that I do within the session is saved and it is saved until I close R. So if I close my R window and open it up again, then the variable then he will be gone because it, it won't remember things between sessions. All right, so if we want to know where we are, right, on the hard drive, um, and again, this is the same as in the terminal, we need to figure out our working directory, right? So if I open up R, it will just set the working directory to where R was opened. So that's generally C, program files, R, something like that. Um, but generally we want to move to a location on the hard drive where we are, right? So I can use the get working directory to see where I'm currently at. So if I go to R and I do a get working directory, um, then what we can see is that currently I'm reading and writing files at this location on my hard drive. So in C, users, Arons, documents. So this is where um, everything is stored. And if I do a dir, so um, a directory listing, um, then it shows that these are all of the files that are there. So you see that I have a whole bunch of photos and like a Valentine's Day, a Valentine's Day PNG located there. If I want to move somewhere else, right, because normally my data is stored on my D drive and not on my C drive, because the C drive I use for, for Windows, um, all of the data um, that I get goes onto the D drive, then I can change my working directory by using the set working directory command, and I can just say, well, move to the D drive. And very similar to the CD um, command that you have in your terminal. So if we then do a dir here, then you can see that now there's all kinds of different files um, like zoom mp4s and pp1 and my recycle bin and these kinds of things. But so you have to manage where you are. You have to tell R explicitly to go to a different directory um, to load or save files there. So you have the get working directory, know where you are on your hard drive. You have dir to see which files are there. You have your set working directory if you want to go from where you are now to somewhere else. Um, if you want to see what is in your current session, right? If I want to know which variables have I got defined, you can use the ls function. So this is a little bit uncommon, um, but in R, if I would type the ls um, function, right? And I would execute it, it would say Danny. Right, because we only defined a single variable and th that had the value of 15. Um, so for example, if I would define a value of 29 and would put it in the variable called Anna, um, then now when I would do ls, I would see that two variables are defined. So it, it, it's just that you don't have to scroll all the way up and like, what did I name my variable? No, you can just use the ls function for that to see all of the, the variables which are defined. All right, so those are the main things to kind of control where R loads data from, where it stores data, and how to move around. Um, if you want to use external packages, and this is really important for R, because if you want to do things like machine learning or you want to use some new fancy regression algorithm, um, then generally those are not standardly installed in R. So R is just the programming language and it has a massive repository of uh, packages which are maintained by other people. Um, so if you want to, for example, install a package called QTL, um, then you can do that using the install.packages function and then you give it the name and the name needs to be surrounded by these quotes, meaning that this is a character vector in, in R. So installing the package doesn't do anything. Um, it just contacts the external server, it downloads the package to your hard drive and then it stops. If you want to use the package, you have to first activate it. And activating a package is done by the library function. So when I do an install, nothing happens. But then when I do library QTL, all of a sudden it makes all of the functions and the data which is stored in this QTL package available um, and now I can use it. So the, the QTL library might give me a function which is called um, scan or some other function. If I want to save a certain object to my hard drive, an, an R object, so something like a variable, I can use the save function. So when I say save um, Danny 
and then I give it a file name, then it will save this variable and the content of the variable to the hard drive in the name that you specify. If I want to uh, load it, then I can just use load. So I just say load and then your data or whatever name I gave it, and then it will reload the variable from the hard drive. So this is one of the ways where when you have something in your session and you need to run out because there was a car crash or something else, um, hey, you, you, you can save um, certain objects for using it later. If you want to save just everything, right? Imagine that I've been doing R the whole day and in the end I have like 50 or 60 variables that I have defined and I just want to dump them all to disk um, because I want to continue tomorrow or someone shouts like, well, you've got three minutes and then the power is turned off. Um, then you can use the save.image. So when you say save.image, you give it a file name and then everything which is currently in the session will be saved to disk. When you quit R, and this is one of these tips that almost no one tells you when you start learning R, when you quit R, never say yes, always say no. Because when you quit the R session, it asks you if you want to save a current image. And then it saves it into some sneaky location, usually in C users in your kind of home drive. Um, and then the next time that you start R, it loads all of the stuff which you had in the session the last time. And this is not bad. It is only bad when you, for example, loaded a 10 gigabyte file and then you quit R and then you just press yes, right? So then it will save what you have had loaded into the session to this sneaky file. And then next time that you start up R, it will load in this file again, making it take like 10 minutes before R is actually available because it needs to load in all of the data. So a tip that I have is when you quit R, um, by doing it in Windows, you can just click the, the, the X on the, on the uh, top right corner. Um, it asks you, do you want to save your session? Always click no. If you want to quit R from the command line, so if you just want to say uh, quit, right, then you can say Q, which is the quit function, but then give it the parameter no to make sure that it doesn't save the whole session. Um, and this is just a very useful tip because otherwise you might run into issues that you start depending on stuff which you had defined previously um, but is not available when you switch to a different computer. Um, so just a tip for me, when you quit R, never ever save the session. If you save the session or if you want to save the session, do it yourself. So just say save.image, give it a file name and then when you start R the next time, say load.image and then give it the file name and then it will reload everything on command. The nice thing about R is that people who write packages for R, they are forced to document every function that they write. So help is available for anything that you want. So every function, even the plus function, right? As simple as the addition operator has a help file. So if you don't know what the plus symbol means, you can look at the help file for the plus symbol. If you just want to know um, what kind of functions there are, right? In, imagine that you're interested in machine learning, um, then you can just do question mark, question mark, machine learning. And then it will show you all of the functions where somewhere in the help file the word machine learning is mentioned. Um, if you want to know what functions there are to do quantum computing, it's the same thing. Just do question mark, question mark, quantum, and all of the files, all of the help files um, that have the word quantum in there will pop up. If you know which function you want to use, you can use the question mark function name and that will directly open up the help file for this function. But the nice thing about R is that it has a lot of built-in help. So if you just want to know what does the sec function do, you can do question mark sec and it will give you like two A4s of description and an example. So the examples are all the way at the bottom of the file. Um, so how to use the function, everyone that writes a function for R and submits it to the repository is required to write a help file and this help file is required to have an example. So just for you guys, um, the question mark operator, use it a lot. If you don't know exactly what to do, just do question mark, search for the thing that you want to do, like standard deviation or quantiles or whatever, and it will open up a list of, of help files for you and you can just see what I need. 
Good. So that's more or less the first couple of things that I wanted to tell you about R. The next thing is about the types of data. So in a lot of programming languages, there is a distinction between things like um, integer values like five so whole numbers and floating point numbers r doesn't have that distinction so in r a numeric value is five but 7.9 is also a numeric value and 10.6 is also a numeric value so r doesn't have this whole number floating point number thing so in r a number is just a number besides that r also knows what logicals are so it knows that true is a one and it knows that false exists. And this is very useful um, because when you do things like if statements, so when you start branching or when you start looping, then you use logicals. Um, we have characters in R. Um, we already saw this when we did the install.package, right? So the, the anything surrounded by two quotes is regarded as being a character value. And there's a, there's a, a layeredness in this. So it means that a logical can be represented as a numeric and a numeric can be represented as a character, but not the other way around, right? So the data types just become bigger and bigger. We have vectors in R. So vectors are a list of numbers, a list of characters or a list of logicals. So vectors always contain a single type um, and have, for example, we can make a vector using the C function, which is the combine function, and this combines everything together in a list. So here we're making a list which has five elements. The first element in the vector is a one, uh, the third element in the vector is 5.3. Um, we can do the same thing with characters and we can do the same thing with logical vectors. However, because of this layeredness, if I start mixing things together, the vector will be of the highest type. Um, so let me quickly give you guys an example about that. So if I say combine uh, 1, 2 and 3, um, then it will just give me a vector of 1, 2 and 3. However, when I say make a vector of 1, 2, 3 and A, then now all of a sudden everything will be transformed into a character, right? Because character is a higher type than uh, numeric um, so a, a character value can be uh, or a numeric value can be represented as a character but a character cannot be represented as a numeric value in R so when I combine stuff together um, then it will always cast it to the highest type in the um, in the vector and that's something that that will screw you over a lot of times um, because you assume that oh I'm working with numeric values but because one of the numbers was not a real number but like had a space in there or a comma um, R now makes all of the values in your vector a character because characters can more or less represent any type. Furthermore R knows what a matrix is so it, it understands a two-dimensional matrix or also three-dimensional matrices um, and you can create a matrix by using the matrix function so you just say matrix fill it with the numbers of 1, 2, 20 so double point is 2 so it's just making a, a vector um, and then you give it the number of rows and the number of columns and then you store it in a variable called y. So this will make a, a standard matrix, a two-dimensional matrix, like an Excel um, sheet. So there are some functions that you need to be aware of when you're working with types in R. Um, for example, if I'm working with vectors, I'm often, I often need to know how many elements there are. So I can use the length function. So the length function on an object will tell you how many items are in a vector. The SDR function will tell you the structure of an object because objects can become very complex and have, like currently we only saw like vectors and matrices have, but we can have things like lists with vectors in there and matrices and other lists so you can make objects as complex as you want um, but the SDR function will give you a graphical representation of the structure of an object. So it will tell you, well, um, you have a list. The first element of the list is a numerical value with a length of 15. The second element of the list is a matrix, which has dimensions of six by six. 
if you want to know the class or the type of an object you can use class right so if I have a vector and I want to know is this a numeric vector a character vector or a logical vector I can just ask the class of this vector and then it will tell me oh the vector that you gave me is a numerical vector the names are when you are dealing with a vector, um, you can give a vector names, but you can also um, re get the names of an object. So let me quickly show you guys an example. So if I have this vector, right, 1, 2, 3, and A, and I store it in V1, um, I can ask the names of V1. So the names of V1, they don't exist at the moment because v1 does not have names but it can for example uh, for example assign names so I can say the names of v1 is um, observation 1 um, observation 2 observation 3 and observation 4 so ops 4 and then close the bracket and now when I look at v1 it now has the names of this um, and now when I just want to get only the names and not the values, I can use names of V1 and this will give me the different names that I just assigned. If you do use names on a matrix, it will give you the column names. Just as a tip. You can, you can force things from one type to another type. Uh, and you can ask if something is of a certain type, so you can use as.logical, as.numeric, as.character, um, and that will transform a character vector into a numeric vector. Of course, the things that it cannot convert, for example, the A in our example, will become an A, so it will become a missing value. Um, and is is used when you want to do manipulation. Um, so if you want to do, if you want to know if this vector is of a certain type, you can use is dot logical, and then it will tell you yes, it is, or no, it isn't. Good. So creating vectors is relatively easy. We can use the C function to combine several objects together. Um, like numbers or logicals or characters. Um, we can also use the sec function to make a numerical sequence. Um, this, is, this needs three parameters. So we say, for example, make a sequence from 1 to 100 by stepping 7 every time. Um, like this. So our window. So I can do sequence of 1 to 1,000, or a 1 to 1,000, stepping by 250, and then it will say, okay, so have from 1, add 250, add 250, add 250. So this is just the sec function. Um, we also have the repeat function. So the repeat function just repeats a certain object an X amount of times. So if I say repeat A, 5, then I will get a vector which has five A's in there. Matrices can be made in two different ways. So the first one we already saw. So I can use the matrix function, then give it a vector of numbers that it should put into the matrix, and then I tell it the number of rows and the number of columns. I can also use the cbind function or the rbind function. So cbind means take a vector and another vector and combine them together um, into a matrix, right? So if I have two vectors of the same length, um, I can make vector one the first column, vector two the second column. Rbind does the same thing, but instead of binding it in a column-wise fashion, it binds two vectors or three vectors together into a row-wise fashion. So, hey, if I have two vectors, the first vector becomes the first row, if I have, uh, if, and the second vector then becomes the second row. Um, so, quick example, um, let me define a vector of, um, so repeat, for example, the letter A uh, 10 times, uh, define another vector which repeats the letter X uh, 10 times, and now I can do a C bind of v1 and v2 and then you can see that now the first column contains the first vector the second column contains the second vector and if i would have used row bind i would have ended up with a vector or with a matrix which looks like this so it has 10 columns the first row contains v1 the second row contains v2 all right so here's the overview slide so um we didn't really talk about the double point operator. So the double point operator is the sec function, um, but it's just shorthand because it always steps by one. You cannot 
give it a different step size. So one double point four me just means one, two, four. So it just creates a vector with one, two, three, and four in there. Um, repeat, um, we talked about, uh, the matrix is more or less the same thing and that's what I showed you guys. So when I type a vector name into R or when I type a matrix into R, um, let me show you here, right? Then what you see is here, you can see this comma something, right? So comma one, comma two, comma three, comma four. So these are the indexes. So here it will say, well, you have one comma, which means the first row, second row, and here it's comma three, which is the third column. So this allows you to select things from your matrix, right? So imagine that from this little matrix, I would want to get the third column. I could say, um, store it in a variable. So I just call the matrix Y, and then I can say Y, and then I could just do comma three, and this would give me back the third column. So R automatically indexes um, the columns and the rows for you. Um, if you have names, you can also use the names, right? So if from Y I wanted to get, um, for example, V1, right? So the, the, the first row, which is called V1, I can just say from V1, give me column number one, two, five, right? So it now will select the, the row, which is called V1, and then it will select columns one, to five or one through five because it will also give you the fifth one. So this is how R shows the indexing. So if you have a matrix and also in a vector you see the number. Um, no, I don't want to become famous so you are just going to be blocked. Where are the block button? Moderator, please help me. Um, ban, there it is. Haha, I did the ban. Good, so the indexes in R are uh, done um, and it shows you the indexes, right? So just that you don't worry like what is this comma one and one comma thing. Um, it just shows you that one comma is the first row, uh, comma two is the, the second column. So how do we index a vector, right? So if we have a vector and we want to get stuff out, well, we can use the square brackets. So for example, imagine that I have a vector which contains the letters A through I, and then I say, well, give me the fifth letter of this vector. I can just do uh, V, right, which is the name. I, I could have called it V1 or V2 or whatever, um, but the square brackets allow you to index into a vector. So if I want to select the fifth element, I just say V, square brackets five. If I want to get two, two, five, so the highlighted part here, then I can say V two, two, five. If I want to get a disjunct set, right? Not everything in a row, but I want to get like the, the eighth number as well. So the number or the letters that are located at index two to five and the one at eight, then I can say, then I can use the combine function and then I can create a vector which has the indexes, right? So I can say combine two, to five comma eight, so make make a vector which contains two, three, four, five, and eight, and then use that to select from V. I hope that's clear because this is something that you do a lot. Matrices work more or less the same way, but now you of course have to give it the rows and the columns that you want to select. So for example, if I want to select from the first column, the first three rows, I am saying M one, two, three, so the first uh, the first part, so everything before the comma signifies the rows that you want to select, everything after the comma is the columns. So remember, first rows, then columns. Um, so one, two, three selects from the first column the elements one, two, three. If I want to say from the fifth row, select element three to six, then it selects this part. Um, I can also select just a single element. So I'm going to say from the matrix, give me the eighth row, seven column. And I can also select the whole column, right? So selecting the whole column just says M, then you don't fill in which rows you want. You just say give me comma nine so give me the ninth column of the matrix so then it will take the whole thing um, no matter how long it is 
All right, so just as a reminder, these are the types of data. So we have logicals, true and false. We have numerical values, which are 5, 7.9, 10.6, which is slightly different from other programming languages. We have character vectors, which are called strings in many other languages, which are things like 1, 2, 3, with the double quotes surrounding it. Um, we have vectors and we have matrices. So R also has some advanced types, because a vector can only be of a single type, right? The same thing holds for a matrix. So a matrix can hold only numerical values or only logical values or only character values. However, in many cases, we actually have a matrix which every column of the matrix is of a different type, right? If I'm measuring um, plants, then the first column might be the name of the plant, then the second column might be the height, which is a numeric value, then the third column might be the color, which is a, a different data type. Then the fourth column might be illogical, right? If it was watered or not, so true or false vector. So to represent this, R has something which is called the data frame. So a data frame is not a matrix. It looks very similar to a matrix, but now every column can be different. So the first column can be numeric, the second column can be character, the third column could be logical, and that is okay. So you create a data frame by defining the three matrices or the three columns that you want. So in this case, we have V1 being one, two, four. Um, we have V2, which is character, plus a missing value and v3 is actually a logical vector. So when we say data.frame v1, v2 and v3 and we store it in a variable called d, then now we make a data frame which is similar to a matrix but the first column is numeric, the second column is character and the third column is a logical value. So a list is very similar to a vector. Um, again, it's just um, a, a, a list of things, um, but it can contain anything, right? So every element of the list can have a different class or can have a different type. Um, so here I'm making a list. The first name or the first element of the list is a named element and it contains a character called Fred. Then the second element of this list is something which is called numbers. And this has not a single number, but this is ve vector v1. So the, the second element of the list contains a vector which is of length 4. We can also say, for example, the third element is called age and it has the value 5.3. So a single numeric value. So a list is very similar to a vector. It's just that a, a vector has to be of a certain type. A list, every element in the list can be a different type. Besides that, in R we have something which is called a factor. So R, because it is a statistical language, it knows about categorical variables, right? So categorical variables are things like male, female, right? So I can use the keyword factor in R to say that this is something which is a categorical variable, right? So here I'm just saying, well, repeat males 20 times, repeat females 30 times, combine this together, so now what I have is a vector which has 40, uh, 50, so 20 and 30, so I have a vector which is of length 50, first there's 20 times the word male, and then there's 30 times the word female. And by now using the factor keyword, R, R looks into the vector, sees which unique values there are, and then says these are the only values that are allowed. So in this case, if I want to add another gender, then it says that you cannot, because the, the, the factor forces it to be one of two categories, either male or either female. And this is very useful when you're dealing with um, categorical variables. Um, and it understands this also at a statistical level because a categorical variable needs to be analyzed differently from a numerical variable. So that is why R has a built-in um, factor type which represents categories. So besides that we have comments. So comments is uh, start with a hashtag and then everything after the hashtag will be ignored. So if you make a script then use comments a lot um, because hey, R will ignore the comments anyway but for 
the people that might read your script in the future or yourself that might read in the future it is really important to know what you were doing and what you were trying to do um, so adding a lot of comments helps a lot with understanding code um, i've been working now in bioinformatics for around 12 to 16 years i think um, and it has helped me a lot. If I look at old code that I wrote like five years ago, then the only reason why I still understand what's going on is because past me left messages for future me. So hey, use comments for yourself in the future so you know what happened and what, what you did. All right, so a quick self-test for you guys at home, and I'm probably not going to wait for you guys to answer it, um, but this is generally one of the questions on the R course. So when I give the R course in the summer semester, then there's one question in the exam which is very similar to this. So it asks you, what is the type of true? So the first element. So you guys want to have a guess? Um, then I can take a sip of coffee and you guys can guess what type this, this first thing is. So what is the type of the first element? Is this logical, numeric, character, matrix, vector, data frame? Um, and logical. Yes, Xanaxin, that is the trick in the trick question. Because it is surrounded by these double quotes, it's a character. Everything surrounded by double quotes is a character. So this is a, a character value. String, yeah. In other languages you would call it a string value, but in R you call it character. All right, so the same thing holds for the second one. Also a trick question. It's not a numeric value. It is, again, a character value. Um, this is a numeric value, 1e plus 11. So this is a 1 times 10 to the power of 11. Um, 0x89 is also a numerical value, it's just a hexadecimal value, so um, this is a different way of writing down numbers where you don't use base 10 but you use base 16. This one is a trick question as well because a lot of people see this um, and then say, oh this is a color. In R this is not a color, in R this is a comment, right? It starts with a hashtag, everything after the hashtag is ignored. So this is just a comment. This is a logical vector. Um, as factor true turns this logical value into a factor value, right? We force it to be a factor. So this is a factor. The is character, this will test if this thing that you throw in is a character value. So is character one times 10 to the power 11? No, this is not the character. So the answer of this is false. But the type of false is a logical. So the is functions is dot something always return a logical value. So always a nice question in the R course. I always love coming up with ways to trick people in, in that sense. And this is generally the only question where I do that um, because I generally don't like trick questions. But here it's like nice to kind of see if you can um, put people on the wrong lag. All right, so a little bit more about lists. If we have a list and we want to take something from the list, since a list is different from a vector, we have to use the double square brackets. So imagine that I make a list, right? And this list is called W. It has four elements. The first element is a character vector of length one. The second one is a a, a numeric vector which has a length of four the third one is again a numeric vector of length one and the, the fourth element in this list is actually a matrix right and that is perfectly fine because a list can contain anything so every element of the list can be a different type so how do I now select the first element from the list right Fred, how do I get that? Well, I have to say from list W. So if you type W and R, it, it shows you this, right? So the names are using the dollar signs and then it says name, dollar sign number, dollar sign age, because I'm automatically assigning um, a, a name to it, right? So if I would use the names function on W, it will tell me name, numbers, age, and matrix. So if I want to get Fred out of this list, right, then I have to say from W, select the first element of the list, and then from what you get back, select the first element again, right? And this is because in R, 
characters and numerics are automatically interpreted as vectors because in R you generally always deal with vectors so a vector of length 1 is not a different type so if I want to just get Fred back I have to say from W take the first element of W and then from the thing that you get back take the first element right because it is a character vector of length 1 but I still have to specify that I want to have the first thing I could also use the uh, the dollar operator and instead of having to do double square brackets and giving it a, the, the index I can just say from W select the numbers vector and then from this numbers vector select the second and the third element right then it will give me back two three so this part of the vector of course this can only be done when you use names right if you don't assign names to the objects then you have to use the double square bracket so I could use W um, dollar matrix one comma which will give you the first row of the matrix which is stored in W um, and you can get the first column um, the same way but here I'm using indexing so here I use the, the number so from the fourth element of W give me the first column right and these two are more or less equivalent except for the fact that here I'm asking for the first row and here I'm asking for the first column so if you can and you're using lists use named lists so make sure that you assign a name to each element of the list then you don't have to use the double square bracket thing you can just say w dollar then the thing that you want to select from so in this case numbers which is the second element right and if in any time in the future you reorder your list or you add another element to the list um, then the name will still be the same while the index might change right if I add something in front of the list then everything would move and and w11 would not select Fred but it would select the thing that I just added to the list in the front of the list so try and use named um, named operators all right, so if I want to work with matrices and data frames, then of course sometimes I want to know how many rows a matrix has, then I can use the n row function. Um, sometimes I want to know how many columns a matrix has, so I can use the n call function. And often I want to do something for each row of the matrix, or I want to do something for each column of the matrix. Um, so I can use n row for the number of rows, n call for the number of columns. I can have row names so if the matrix has row names or column names then I can get those by typing row names matrix or call names matrix but I can also use um, the the arrowhead operator to assign the row names so if I have a matrix which has three rows right then I can name these rows by saying row names of the matrix a b and c so I can just directly assign into this function if I would type the, the row names matrix I would get back the names but by assigning to it it will update the, the row names of the matrix or it will update the column names of the matrix in many cases you run into issues with matrices and that is because the matrix so have for example if I want to make box plots in R then the box plots function takes every column of the matrix and makes it into a box plot if I by chance have my data structured wrongly or differently right and I have my data in the rows and not in the column then I can use the transpose function so the transpose function what it does it takes the first row of the matrix and then makes the transpose of this then the first row of the matrix becomes the first column the second row of the matrix becomes the second column and the third row of the matrix becomes the third column so it just takes the matrix and puts it on its side so it switches it, it switches rows and columns and this is very useful because in a lot of a lot of times the function that you're dealing with is not exactly knowing what data you have like I said the box plot function assumes that when you call it on a matrix that you want to have every row or every column of the matrix represented as a box plot but if you do the heat map function it assumes that you want to use every row so it often you have a matrix the matrix is formatted in a certain way but the function that you want to use just expects the matrix to be more or less the other way around so by using the T function you can transpose a matrix so its rows become the columns and the columns become the row 
All right, um, 155. Let's do one or two more slides, right? So um, we're a little bit behind, little, little bit behind, like slide 24 out of 100. So um, we're, we're getting there. Okay, so variables we've already seen, right? So variables in my mind are boxes. So you can put things in the box. You can use like the uh, arrow or you can use the is assignment operator. But you can use this box without knowing what's in it. And that's the nice thing about variables, right? So variables are kind of boxes. So in the mind, they are like a, a layer of abstraction. So you can just assign something to a variable and then you can use like the properties of the variable saying for every element in this variable do something right and then it doesn't matter if there's one element in the variable or if there's a hundred um, it will just do it for each element so we've already seen variables right so variables can be like have holding single numerical values like 1.5 um, here we define a variable called can which has two elements so the first one is uh, true so this is a logical vector um, here we're assigning a vector of length 4 to a variable called have um, here we assign again a two logical vector to many and then here we assign the value of minus 5 to names and you are free to choose the variable names so when you come up with a variable name, make it a good name, right? So don't use variable called X, right? That doesn't mean anything to anyone. Just say average temperature, right? And the nice thing about R is, is that you have the, um, the tab operator. Um, so if you have a variable called um, temperature measurements uh, on day five, right and this would be yeah, just some temperatures that you measured so let's just put something in um, right this is a very long variable name but it is a very meaningful name right because i know exactly what it means if i now want to use this in r i don't have to type it in i can just say temp then press top and then it will tell me all of the possibilities. So pressing top twice will show that, okay, so when you start with temp, there's something called temp deer, temperature measurements on day five and temp file. So these are two, two, two functions that are built in. But as soon as I say, okay, so temp, air, and then I press top and it just fills in the whole name for me. So don't restrict yourself. Don't make your variable names too small, make them meaningful. Right, so that's that's a, a tip saying that if you define a variable, give it a good name, right? And if you it, temperature is a relatively good variable name, temperature in Celsius is a better one. Temperature in Fahrenheit is also a better one, right? Because now it has the unit, so people know what's what you mean. All right, so variables you can give them names yourself. Um, I would always advise people to have meaningful names, speaking names, tell people what this variable is doing. All right, so I always advise people to code clean and that means create scripts, right? So um, use a new file for a new lecture, right? So if, if you're starting to answer assignments and that's the same way as the assignments are uploaded to Moodle, um, if you have the answers right, it's in a single file. So lecture one um, or the assignments to lecture one, in my mind, there should only be a single file which contains the answers to that. But then when you look at uh, when you start doing the answers to the second lecture, those go into a next file, right? So a file is also a, an encapsulation unit. It stuff which belongs together is in a single file and these files have logical names. So when you start coding, um, one of the things that you should kind of force yourself to do is to always add a header to each file. So a comment section where you state the name of the file, the name of the author, the date at which the file was created, the purpose of the file, and always add something about copyright. Say just on the top of the file, this is mine and no one is allowed to use it. Or say, I don't care, anyone can use it, right? Just state the purpose of the file, so what is it going to do, and state kind of what you think is the copyright. So it, 
it is mine no one is allowed to use it unless they say my name 15 times um, and of course use a lot of comments in each of the files that you create so a little example that that I generally use so this is generally the header that I make so here we see the purpose of the file right so the purpose of this file is the analysis of Hardy Weinberg equilibrium then the copyright is this file was written in 2015 so the copyright is 2015 and of course since I'm working for the Humboldt University the copyright is not mine right I made this file because I work for the Humboldt University and the Humboldt University is kind of the owner of the copyright. Everything that I do at work does not belong to me, but belongs to the university I work for. Um, but of course it is written by me. So, right, written by Denny Arendt. So anyone seeing this file in the future knows, okay, so if there's anything wrong with this file and it does not compute the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, then complain at this guy. Um, I always add a, or I always try to add a uh, first written and a last modified date to each of the files that I create, just so that for me I can kind of look back in history and say, okay, so what did I do in April? Well, in April of 2015, I modified this file. This is not entirely required, right? When you use things like uh, version control, like Git or GitHub, um, then GitHub will also track this data for you. When did, was it first written? When was it last modified? For by, but for people looking at the file, um, it's just handy to have this information on the top. And it doesn't cost that much time. So I just have a standard header that every time that I open up a new file and create a new script, I just copy paste in the header and adjust it and just say, well, instead of analysis of Hardy Weinberg, this is something like this. And of course, these first modified and last modified, when you use version control, it's not that important, but it is something that you have to keep in mind that people want to know how old a certain script is or how new. And then generally all my scripts start with a set working directory because I need to move somewhere, right? The data does not live in R, um, so I have a set working directory. So where do I go? Well, in this case, I go to my D drive, to the folder called R course, and then to the folder called assignments. So this is more or less an example of a header, and these kinds of headers I put in each one of my files. All right, so it's 2.02. Um, let's do a short break. Um, yeah. Let's do a short break, um, then I can get some more coffee. I still have a little bit, but um, perhaps you guys want to get some coffee as well. So thank you guys for uh, the being here the first hour. Um, I will stop the recording. So people on YouTube, see you on the next uh, part of the lecture.